When it comes to insect collections, there are a few things to keep in mind, so let's go through them together. First, we need to find and capture the insects. This shouldn't be too hard, as insects and other arthropods can be found virtually everywhere. Forests, fields, ponds, and streams will be full of insects. Even an outdoor light in an urban environment can attract a wide variety. The time of day can be an important variable for capture, because different insects are active at different times. For example, some insects may be active in the morning, while others may only be active during the evening hours. Once an insect has been discovered, there are many different methods for capturing them. Techniques for physically capturing insects range from actively chasing them down to collecting them using traps. Using traps to capture insects is particularly applicable for research or monitoring purposes where large sample sizes are needed. Depending on the target insect, different traps may be used, such as malaise traps for flying insects, pitfall traps for ground-dwelling insects, or baited traps for specific species. Some people might prefer to simply capture an image of the insect and can use a camera to photograph the specimen. Insects can be captured by sweeping the net through vegetation or by tapping plants and holding the net underneath to capture falling insects. More often, a sheet or a plastic tray is placed beneath the plant, which is then shaken or tapped, in a tactic known as the knockdown method. Of course, chasing down larger insects works as well, but it can be tough work. Collecting aquatic insects requires a slightly different set of tools and techniques. Dr. Heather Proctor, a professor at the University of Alberta, is an expert on the subject of aquatic invertebrates, and she has some tips and tricks for the collection and preservation of aquatic specimens. Hi, I'm Heather Proctor. I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. I work on lots of invertebrates, but one of the things I'm uh, most knowledgeable in is freshwater invertebrates. Well, my interest started very early when I was probably five. Um, living in St. Albert, we would go on little field trips in kindergarten and elementary school to local sloughs, and we would take, uh, you know, coat hangers and we'd make tiny little nets out of the nylons that we stole from our mom's nylon drawer and then we would take a pickle jar and we'd go down to the uh, slough and collect things and look at them and there'd be all these animals bopping around in the jar and we'd say teacher what's that and teacher would say I don't know and this happened all the way through high school when I would take pickle jars to my teachers full of animals and I'd say what are these and they would say I don't know golden guide to pond animals allowed me to discover that some people do know what the animals are and so that started me on the pathway to becoming a freshwater invertebrate biologist and taxonomist myself. A huge diversity of arthropods, many familiar um, adult versions of the pond dwelling arthropods such as uh, damselflies and dragonflies, mayflies and caddisflies, they all have their juvenile stages in water. So you can collect the younger stages in the water bodies. There are also some that live entirely in water, uh, so water mites will be found only in the water or when they're juvenile uh, larvae attached to the bodies of, uh, of aquatic insects. So there are a couple of reasons to collect aquatic arthropods. One is simply because you work on aquatic arthropods and you need to know more about their biology or their taxonomy or their distribution. Um, but a great many um, researchers collect aquatic arthropods and other invertebrates because it's part of a biodiversity monitoring program. So uh, biodiversity monitoring programs if they're very broad, should include both terrestrial uh, collections, so for plants and animals on land, but they should be also interested in aquatic health and so should collect the organisms that live in both standing and running water. When you're uh, collecting aquatic invertebrates, uh, just like if you're collecting terrestrial flying, um, insects, you want to use a net, but unlike uh, uh, those sorts of nets, aquatic nets are much 
tougher because they have to uh, withstand going through water and maybe bumping into sticks and rocks and things like that. Um, and also the mesh tends to be finer. Uh, the mesh on this net is super fine. This is a, a, a net that will be very good at collecting even zooplankton, you know, things less than a millimeter long. But very often people use a, a mesh size of 500 microns. That's typically the standard for aquatic invertebrate collecting. For aquatic collecting, typically you, you need to uh, get your animals um, out of a white tray that you put down on the ground, empty your sample into the white tray, and then pick out the individuals using a, a pipette um, or using a, a cap. Or if it's a big thing that's not going to bite you like a snail, you can pick it up and just put it into whatever container you're going to use to take the animal home. Or you can put it directly into whatever preservative that you want to use. So aquatic invertebrate bodies are very watery. Uh, and so to preserve them, you can't just put them in a killing jar because your killing jar would be very wet very soon. And also the bodies are not very strong. So unlike terrestrial arthropods, which have strong chitinous bodies for, for living in air, many aquatic invertebrates are quite squishy and fragile. So they're preserved in ethanol. Um, but again, because their water, their body is very filled with water, you don't preserve them directly into 70% ethanol because the uh, water in their bodies will dilute that to below 70% and then they will rot. So typically you would plop them into 95% ethanol. When you collect your, uh, your specimen, um, the next thing that happens to it depends a lot on the individual. So if you're collecting mites, you may want to put them immediately into Konica's fluid. If you're collecting uh, insects, they may go into alcohol. If you're collecting insects that are very uh, sturdy bodied, like adult beetles, uh, which uh, can also live in um, standing and running water, they can actually go into a regular killing jar uh, after you've removed water from them. But very often people will want to bring back their specimens live to the laboratory to uh, pick out the samples there, in which case you would carry a container of water, either in a, uh, a sturdy screw top container with hard sides or in a double bagged Ziploc and take that back to the laboratory for examination and careful preservation of each individual specimen. I've made some surprising discoveries relatively recently when I tried to use a new technique that I'd never used before, which was to collect aquatic weeds, uh, aquatic, subaquatic plants, take those home and extract them in a Tulgren funnel. I'm sure that you'll learn about Tulgren funnels in other collecting methods, but basically it is a big funnel with a light bulb above it that dries out material and the animals will move down and then fall through into a collecting cup. Um, I didn't really expect to find exciting things from aquatic samples that way, but what I did find uh, in relatively large numbers were subaquatic caterpillars. Um, this had not been really known from Alberta beforehand, but they're very, very common and do not show up very readily when you're collecting in the traditional fashion with a net. My favorite arthropod is this water mite, which I worked on for my master's degree, which was 30 years ago. This t-shirt is also 30 years old. The water mite's name is Unionicola crisippes, and that was named by Mueller. And it's a very elegant, beautiful water mite, as you can see. Uh, it uh, feeds on zooplankton, which it captures by grabbing it with its spiny forelegs. Captured insects must be properly preserved before they can be included in a collection. Most insects are pinned when their bodies are still soft. Pinning is sometimes done with the help of a spreading board for large insect specimens. The first step in pinning and spreading an insect is to insert a pin through the insect to secure it to the spreading board. Depending on the type of insect, the correct positioning of the pin will differ. Once the specimen is dry, it will need to be labeled before it can be positioned in a display case. Not all insect specimens can be pinned for preservation, and most of the time, soft-bodied insects, or larvae, are preserved in vials of ethanol. Some small insects are glued to the tip of a small triangular piece of paper. A pin is then inserted through the paper rather than the insect. 
This process is known as pointing. Extremely small insects, like fleas or lice, may be too small to even point. These specimens will have to be carefully mounted on microscope slides and positioned so that their distinguishing features are visible for species identification. They are then preserved using fixatives. The final, and some may argue the most critical step of insect collection, is labeling the specimen. The label should provide several pieces of essential information about that particular specimen. Without appropriate and accurate labels, the specimen will essentially be useless. Entomologists have developed a certain protocol that should be followed in the labeling process. All specimen labels must include the location where the insect was found. Additional details, such as which plant it was found on, are often helpful too. Another critical piece of information is the collection date, and some collectors may even note the time of day. The name of the original collector is usually included, since insect collections almost always contain specimens collected by more than one individual. Finally, it can be helpful to include the species name of your specimen, if it's known. This is usually done on a separate piece of paper. Both labels are then positioned on the pin underneath the insect using a pinning block to properly space the labels so that they can easily be read without disturbing the specimen. If the specimen is stored in alcohol, write labels for these specimens in either pencil or alcohol-proof ink to ensure that the labels of your collection can stand the test of time.